Syzygy, episode 44, Waterworld? Welcome back for another edition of the Syzygy podcast. Emily sitting opposite me here at the table, Emily Brunston, astronomer. Listen, there's been a lot of stuff in the news. Big, really exciting news this week. We found another Earth, apparently. Big watery planet with swimming pools and lakes and probably ducks and fish. And this is big stuff, yeah, right? No, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, Hang on. Let's, let's rewind this just a little do bit I here. To, oh, did I come into that a little bit too hard? I think so, Because yeah. that's what everyone's been doing this week, right? It's It's been... Ah, look, have you been hiding under a rock? There's been reports in all the big papers and like I've seen it everywhere from sort of, you know, BBC through to the big newspapers here in the UK and in America and so on. Everyone's been covering this discovery of a new exoplanet which has got water and it's been been reported as this is a kind of Earth-like planet with lots of water on it. And this is amazing because fantastic is the first time we've ever seen it. And and you can just follow the ellipsis from there too. It's probably got people on it and but it's not quite that not real, quite. is it? No. Not quite. All right. I mean the hyperbole is valid in some sense because this is a really important discovery. And I think we need to talk about why it's actually important. Not because there are humans you know, wandering around having lovely beach holidays on this um, exoplanet. But it's because this is this is a really important first for us. So as usual, it's it's quite possible that the world's media understandably have been a little bit distracted by something which isn't quite the news. And it's it's our turn to sort of fill in some of those gaps for them from the astronomer's point of view of, no, really, this is actually very, very cool. Before we get to that, though, a little bit of follow up. Last time in episode 43, we were having a bit of a chat at the end about the fact that Everyone and their dog is going to the moon at the moment. And the latest group who were trying to land something on the moon was India. And that was going to happen a couple of days after we recorded the podcast. And so we sort of say, hey, we're going to tune in and watch that happen. And so, Emily, how'd that turn out? Well, unfortunately, not very well. (sighs) Yeah, we uh, lost communication with the lander when it was a few kilometres above the surface of the moon. Now, I've got a little bit of deja vu here because it wasn't that long ago that we had a very similar issue with the Israeli lander, wasn't it? Yeah, so the Israeli one, it didn't decelerate fast enough, basically. It, It just sort of crash landed into the moon Um, probably the same thing ended up happening with uh, this other um, Indian lander Chandrayaan 2 but we don't really know all the details and actually it's still not very clear exactly what went wrong yet Mm. the orbit is still going so that's that's great and we've so the mission isn't completely dead no the lander is we can see the lander on the moon (laughs) we know where it is can't talk to it and say, hey, what what went wrong there? That's very disappointing. But it just points out just how hard this is, right? Yeah, I mean, we can take it for granted so easily. You think the moon, oh, is pretty close. We're good at getting landers onto Mars and, on, you know, doing things in the yeah, outer solar system. How hard can it be? You and I could do it. We could send something up. But no, it is super, super hard and a lot of chance in there as well. Yeah, I mean... Getting to the moon is hard enough. Just getting off the planet, getting out of the atmosphere, takes an enormous amount of Bernie stuff. Um, And then getting to the moon is a very, very long way. But that's actually, in a way, the easy part. Stopping enough to be able to land on the thing, which just brings further back. We've talked about this a lot recently, and I know, I know, I know, 50th anniversary of landing on the moon, yada, yada. But it just points out how staggering it is that the first time we tried to do that with human beings 50 years ago, Apollo 11, it worked. Yeah, It could have gone so horribly wrong. We were so, so lucky. Yeah, Like this year alone on an N of two, it's naught for two, right? Yeah. And that's not even with people on board. So yeah, well done. Well done everyone involved in the Apollo Apollo missions. Yeah. But this is definitely not the end for India's space program. I mean, They'll, they'll be trawling through all those data that they've got from this mission and they, they'll be back. Yeah, yeah. 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 Do we know who's next? Um, so, well, I suppose Chandrayaan 3 will, I guess. will come along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, it's a huge achievement just to, to do what they've done. So, I mean, it's, it's not a failure. Yeah. It's just a minor setback. Yeah. So well done, everyone, for, for getting as far as you did. And we look forward to seeing the next one, which absolutely convinced, really hope it's going to work. So back to the news of the day. 
big, watery, Earth-like planets that may be slightly overhyped. Emily, what's the story? Who's who's done what? What's been found? Well, okay, this is very interesting because there's actually two papers that came out at the pretty much exactly the same time. Because what's happened is Hubble did some observations of an exoplanet, and those data are public. So two groups kind of picked them up, two you know, groups expert at doing okay. this kind of analysis. So Hubble, when, when Hubble goes and observes stuff, it all just gets dumped online somewhere? Um, the, yeah, well, basically, yeah, basically in a big database. Right. Um, yeah, so but it, someone's it, deciding where it's pointing. So presumably it was pointing at, at somewhere in the sky for a reason. Yes, and so these were very deliberate observations okay. of this exoplanet. So the, the science that we're going to be talking about comes from two papers. So the one is Benek and Al, um, which can, is submitted to the Astrophysical Journal, and that's available on archive. And the other one is um, we've got Cesaris and Al, which is gone through nature astronomy so it's what's really cool i guess is that the bottom line of both of these papers because i read both of them is they get the same result right so <laughs> which is always good it's really you know, good so corroboration is always yes. important yes so you know the 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 techniques work that we're doing right but were they were they working completely independently did they know that each other was doing work on the same they must thing? be reasonably i'm not sure and it's not quite my field but um they do cite each other in the papers so they obviously know of sure. each other's work sure. okay. um yeah so uh what this is a, a planet that we knew about exoplanet that we knew about it's called k2 18b okay another fabulous ast- astronomical name okay yep, but where does is it, it does have some meaning um so it's about 110 light years away okay not too far yeah, so it's a reasonably close one, and that's you should also pick up um, some clues maybe because of the name too from that. Okay, what was it again? So K two K two eighteen B eighteen B. Okay, so the B part. Now I remember this right because there's no A, is there? There's right? no A. You, you name the planets in order of discovery. Excellent. Yep. Right. Okay, and you you name them by letters of the alphabet, but for reasons that are not clear to anyone. A doesn't exist. So B is the first planet discovered around K218? Well, actually, the 18 means the 18th system that was discovered oh. by this particular mission oh, to K2. have a planet. K2. K2, right. Kepler. Kepler, yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we're Slowly talking... switching on here this morning. Yeah. Yep. So Kepler was um, a astronomical telescope that was um, pointed to – we did this very, very big, long survey called the main Kepler mission where we looked at 100,000 stars that were not particularly bright necessarily but in the same point in Cygnus. Once – Kepler kind of broke a little bit and couldn't point very well. Started to fall we apart. started working on the ecliptic doing bright stars. So K2 stars tend to be a lot brighter okay. than Kepler stars. Right. So it's the 18th system from the K2 Kepler mission and the first planet found. Right. Yes. Good. So what? What did they find? So they discovered this planet back in 2015. It's a super Earth. So okay. what that means is that it's about twice the diameter and about eight times the mass of Earth. Now, this falls into that range that we don't see in our own solar system, do we? We've sort of got earthy sized things and they've got really big things, but there's kind of this gap. Yeah. In the middle. Is yeah. that right? There is. And it's a wonderful gap because it's actually the most common type of exoplanet falls in this gap between Earth and Neptune. Which is a really weird coincidence, I guess, that we happen to not have them. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm right in remembering that when, when astronomers went first went looking for exoplanets, they went, well, we won't find any of that size. We're going to find loads of Earthy sized things and loads of Jupiter sized things, but there won't be anything in between. And lo and behold, oh, look, there's all these super Earth any Neptune type things. Yeah. And yeah. this is one of them. Exactly. Yep. It is a coincidence that we don't have any. There's there's no sort of there's nefarious no reason why we don't. Real reason. It's just to do with the way that your planets get sort of distributed in the evolution of the solar system. Right. It's God having a joke. <laughs> All right. Okay. So it's it's a super Earth. It's super Earth. Cool. Um, and it's in the habitable zone of right. its host star. So that's really important. So that means that it's close enough and not too far away from the star. It's this Goldilocks idea. It's close enough to be warm, but not too far away to be too cold. Right. And not too close to be too warm. Exactly. Yep. So liquid water basically can exist inside the habitable zone is the, is the loose definition. Right. And liquid water important because we think, at the moment at least, that that's... If we're going to look at, at sort of, you know, the Goldilocks principle of, of is it too cold, is it too hot, to support life type things, then we look around us and we look at the things that we know about that are life type things, and liquid water seems to be pretty paramount. So if we can at least aim for that, 
then we're looking in the right kind of place, we think. And so this is one of those. Exactly. This is a liquidy, yep. watery, Goldilocksy type planet. Yep. Good. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's great. So that's quite nice. Well done all. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's kind of, it's in a nice system. It's, it's, in a, it's in a system that we can also observe a lot, which means that it's going around quite a cool star. The star's only... Cool as in temperature cool, cool. not as in awesome. Hasn't got some sunglasses on right. at the moment. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, uh, so, yeah, it's about 3,500 degrees, which is, so our star's about 5,800 Okay. It's so a bit surface. cooler than ours. Yeah. Um, but what that means is that, is that the habitable zone of that star is a lot closer to that star because it's cooler. Mm-hmm. And therefore, the planet goes around much, much faster. So the number of orbits, say, a year doesn't take as long as a year takes on Earth. In fact, a year takes um, 33 days. 33 days. So that is very quick. That's very quick. That's a month. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's a lot closer to its its star, its sun, its cooler sun. But it's in the Goldilocks zone. It doesn't really matter how long the year is. Um, so fantastic. This is great. So we've got, just to sum up, super Earth-sized uh, in the habitable zone around a star which we can observe really, really easily. And it's got, it's got water. How it does. Do, how do we know water. it's got how do, how do we know? So this is a wonderful thing about this um, system is that we found it because the planet is transiting in front of its star. Okay. It's one of these transity times. Yeah. Okay. So what that means is the planet comes between us and the star and makes the light from that star drop just a tiny, tiny little bit. Right. And so when you look for that signature of bright star, bright star, bright star, oh, that just went a little bit less bright. And then you see that repeat presumably every 33 days, then there's a planet going in front of that. That's how we spot it. Exactly. And that's how we tell things like how long the, the year is on this particular planet. We tell the distance from the, from the star, all these kinds of things. So, But if we want to know what that planet is made of, then we've got to make another set of observations. What sort of thing? So this is where Hubble comes in. What we want to do is we want to understand the chemical composition by a process called spectroscopy. Okay. So talk us through that one. What do we have to do? So instead of just looking at the brightness of the star and saying, okay, it's dropping, what we want to do with that light from the star now is to break it up into all the constituent parts of the spectrum. So it's like using a prism to create a rainbow. Right. You take, I mean, this is, this is the, the, the principle of a, of a rainbow that you see on a, on a rainy day when the sun's pointing in the right direction, right? All the tiny little droplets of water will break the, the white light that we see outside, the normal sunlight, and break it into its constituent colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, apparently, because that's different from blue, and violet. And that shows that, that light comes in all these different frequencies, all these different wavelengths. What we see is different colors. But when you've got light shining through a material, like the, the atmosphere of a planet, interesting things happen with those different frequencies, don't they? Yeah. So, I mean, a very basic analysis that we do very, very often as astronomers is to start with the light from the star and understand what chemicals a star is made of. Right, because the different chemicals will be spitting out their own particular fingerprint frequencies of light, won't they? Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, in the spectrum of a star, you pretty much always see really, really big hydrogen lines. Right, because there's a lot of hydrogen. There's a lot of hydrogen in these stars. Yeah, and you can see that as very bright, very particular colors in the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So now then if you take a planet, well, planets aren't bright. They, they don't shine from their own light like a star does. So we can't do the same technique directly with a planet. We can't just point a spectrograph at a planet and say, oh, look, that's what you're made of. But what we do is some very clever techniques using the light from the star that the planet is going around. And this particular technique is called transmission spectroscopy. Transmission meaning going through. Yep. Yeah. So what we do is we wait until we know that the planet is behind the star Mm -hmm. and we take a spectrum of the star. Okay, so the planet's not involved at all. We can't see it, not there, just star. Just star. And we we take lots of measurements to see really what is the the spectrum of the star. And then we wait for the planet to be in transit. That means in between us and the star. So it's blocking the light, some of the light from the star. That doesn't matter. The chemical composition of the star is still the same. But some of that light is, if it's got an atmosphere, is passing through the atmosphere and coming towards us. That's the transmission part. The light's going through the atmosphere. And along the way, that light is interacting with whatever chemicals are in the atmosphere. Exactly. So the spectrum looks a tiny little bit different when the planet's in front of the star than when it's behind it. So I'm guessing that if you take away that first reference measurement of the star by itself 
from the one where the planet is in front, when it is transiting in front of the star, take the first one away from the second one, what you're left with is that's what the chemical signature of the atmosphere looks like. Exactly, yeah. Wow. So it's, yeah, just difference of between star plus planet and star alone. So how accurate is that? How, how well can you see what's there? So it's pretty tough, actually. It doesn't sound easy, to be honest. It's not easy at all. And what the real hindrance is, is the best way that we can do spectroscopy currently um, is by using instruments that are currently on the ground. Mm -hmm. So our best spectrographs, things like HARPs that find exoplanets using basically spectroscopic techniques, are on the ground where you've got to look through the atmosphere of the Earth and it gets really complicated trying to disentangle everything yeah, that I mean, you our seeing. atmospheres, as we've talked about before, it's, it's hard, it's wobbly, it gets in the way, it's, yeah. Okay, but they use Hubble. They use Hubble. One. So Hubble has some really basic spectroscopic sort of tools that it can use. It's actually got something called the Wide Field Camera and it's got a grism on this a, wide field. A grism. A grism. And what's that? <laughs> it sounds very silly. It's a lovely it's Sounds a lovely like word. something from a Dr. Seuss book. What is it? It's a grating prism. A grating prism. Yeah. All right. So the idea is that you take the light and you take a picture. So you're seeing the image just straight off. But at the same time, you're also taking a spectrum of that image that you're seeing. So you've got sort of part of the light that comes through, makes your picture, and then part of it goes through the grating prism part and makes your spectrum right okay but it's not like a super high resolution spectrum like the kind that i'm used to dealing with every day and especially not because this is in the infrared part of the spectrum okay so hubble hasn't been designed from the ground up to be able to do this sort of thing to the to the absolute cutting edge that we could do it from down on the ground but it does have the benefit of being not down on the ground exactly in space exactly so you know six or one half a dozen of the other yeah cool so that's and that's exactly what we were using to look at it um one of the groups also got some data from spitzer which is an infrared space telescope as well and what we ended up with was maybe uh not even quite a couple of dozen points in the spectrum and the graphs on this are really, really lovely in the in the articles um, because you see this kind of these points and they've got these big, big error bars. But you can fit models to see, OK, what is causing these particular points to be in the locations they are. So just unpacking that a little bit. I mean, if you're if you look at the, the spectrum of the of the sun, for example, and I mean, even if we're only talking in the infrared, there's still an enormous amount in there. You know, you can you can get a lot of information from that spectrum, all sorts of different spectral lines that say there's this particular thing and there's this particular thing and there's this particular thing. Um, and what you're saying is that they managed to get six points on the on the spectrum from the from these measures. Oh, but a bit more than that. So a bit more yeah, than that. somewhere between I'd say twelve and fifteen right. or something about that. So it's it's some data, but it's not an enormous amount of data. Like the sort of the sort of spectral data that, that you can get by looking at something like the sun or something that you've got a really good look at is incredibly detailed and really like you can get enormous amounts of information out of it. That doesn't sound like very much, only a dozen or so. And yet if you have a model for what you might be looking at, it's either going to fit that data or it's not. Exactly, exactly. And from the data, it's quite obvious that there is some depression in the spectrum, which means there's absorption, which means there's some water, which is at this particular wavelength, that's absorbing some of the light that's coming from that star. So there's kind of missing, missing water. Like right. Missing light with these, these water molecules. Right, because right. we know how water works, right? We know what happens when light goes through an atmosphere with water in it because we've got one. Yeah. <laughs> we can do that one really, really well. And so we can apply that model really quite carefully and see. So what you're, what you're saying is that in these measurements, they see a, a drop in the signal of this spectrum right where you'd expect it to be if there was water. Exactly, exactly. And this is pretty clear? Like there's not much doubt about this? There's, not, there's no doubt that, that there's water there. Okay. I mean, these, these are great observations. And the, the, what's really the interesting thing is how do you take those that idea that there's water here and construct a picture of what the exoplanet might look like? Sure. I mean, that does sound... You know, you, you sometimes see these discoveries of, you know, an ancient, ancient, like, you know, 100,000 year old skull has been dug up somewhere and they reconstruct the face. And you think, really? Like, how much of that is real and how much of it is just, well, it could have looked a little bit like this. So how much can you extrapolate from a spectrum that says, yep, 
looks like a bit of water to therefore this is what the planet looks like. Well, we are building more and more models to see, to do this exact kind of measurement. But at this point in time, there's a little bit of um, like crossover between different models. Sometimes the same data can fit more than one model. And that's exactly what one of the papers is presenting. Basically, they found a really interesting part, which is that there's evidence that the water is cycling between two phases, which means that it's cycling between being a gas and being a liquid. That's called rain, isn't it? <laughs> isn't yeah. That, isn't that what we call rain? That's exactly what we call rain. So, yeah. we, so vapor, water vapor is in the atmosphere and it's changing between liquid water and water vapor, water wow. droplets. So they can, they can tell that just from sifting between different possible models of the data that they've got. Yeah. As, you know what, maybe it's raining on this planet. So I think going to rain is another step again. Okay, that but, might be, maybe I'm getting but into at least sort of extrapolation You've got water droplets yeah. and you've got water vapour in okay. the atmosphere. That's, right. that's what we can say. Look, I'm going to call that rain, okay? <laughs> I'm just, let me, okay. I'm part of the problem, aren't I? <laughs> Cool. Okay, but that's interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. And the models that would, that fit these data the best are also very interesting. So there's three models that were tested, and there's no statistical way to say which is best. So when that happens in science, we just say, well, these are the three sure. that we fit yeah. at this moment. Um, now, this is something that I learned. I went to a conference uh, last year, actually, and I thought, you know, I'm quite interested in astrobiology and uh, finding life in the universe. I'm just going to bob into the astrobio um, sure. part of this conference and listen to some of the talks and see what's going on in the field. Because I was like, yeah, oh, you know, it must be easy. They've just got spectra. Just... <laughs> How hard How, can it be? Yeah, they really? must be really close to finding these, yeah. these, these signatures of life. And I got into this, um, uh, the this session and there were – endless talks on different ways to model clouds wow and at this point i started to realize actually atmospheres are quite complicated mm. yeah. yeah and it depends I mean, on how you model a cloud as to what's in your atmosphere go ask any terrestrial atmospheric chemists you know it's, this is not easy stuff so well done yeah so my, it, i was totally blown away yeah. by just the complexity and it is nice thing. to know that the pointy end of research is indeed very pointy it doesn't matter which room you wander into at the conference it really is heavy stuff yeah must have been pretty cool but it was really yeah. it was really yeah. interesting a bit humbling but, perhaps. yeah and part of me was just like wow those are a lot of people who are worried about a lot about clouds <laughs> <laughs> clouds on other planets yeah. curiously okay so what are our what are our okay. best three models so they well some, unsurprisingly that some of them include clouds some of them don't right so it depends whether your planet is cloudy or not so there's three models. Two of them have clouds. One of them doesn't. Oh, sorry. Two of them don't have clouds. One of them has clouds. So model number one has no clouds. Um, and in this model, then basically 20 to 50% of the atmosphere would be water. Okay. How does that compare to us? What's the proportion of our atmosphere that's water? So I looked this up. We are somewhere between 0.2% and 4%. Okay. So that's a lot more water than us. Yeah. And that that's depends like where you go. really foggy foggy place that's yeah quite humid yeah mm -hmm. that's that's worse than the tropics <laughs> that's, a, that's a pea soup fog that one. yes yeah. yeah so that's a lot of water um so clearly that's not going to be a very nice place to go well a bit damp you yeah. know you're just going to be sort of three quarters half quarters swimming of the through the <laughs> through the atmosphere there uh, so that's option number one mm -hmm. option number two is there's no clouds um but there's lots of kind of other molecules in the atmosphere so we start with, first, first of all, adding in um, molecular hydrogen, H2, and helium. So those are often um, parts of very, very what we call primary atmospheres. So things like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune have a lot of these uh, molecules in their atmospheres because they held on to them from the very, very early stages of the solar system. Okay. So we put those in. We also put in some kind of um, other molecules um we use nitrogen as kind of the proxy but it could be anything sure, really. sure. i mean we've got um, a lot of lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere why not throw some of that in sure but it doesn't really matter so much to the to the model anyway yeah so we add some of those in and um so the so then that model sort of comes up with these numbers between 0 0.1 percent and 12 and a half percent water depending on what you're doing and the final model is the same thing again except there's clouds as well right so okay all right. So there's a couple of competing models that at the moment we can't decide between, like none of them are really standing out. So winding this all the way back then, here's the discovery. We have a super Earth-sized thing, lump of rock, 
It is a rocky planet, I'm assuming, at that site. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll back off that <laughs> yeah, one for a second. Maybe. Park that mm-hmm. one. It's in the Goldilocks zone around a star, which is a bit cooler than our own, so it's a bit closer every 33 days. And there is water, pretty convincing evidence that there is water, which is changing phase between sort of a, a, a gaseous and a, and a liquidy star. And so huge press coverage of, wow, it's just like us. Like this is a big Earth-type planet. But what you're describing doesn't necessarily sound particularly earthy. So where does the hyperbole end? Where does the wishful thinking end? What What is this thing most likely to be? So, well, we can take the scientific statement, which mm-hmm. this is this is the first earth sized mm-hmm. now you have to do the the air, <laughs> the air kind quotes. of yeah air yeah, quotes listeners for this. need to earth imagine sized. some pretty severe emily earthquakes going on there <laughs> exoplanet with water yep okay and that's that's a huge achievement right we've yeah. we've found water in other exoplanets but they've been super big gas gas giants like jupiter saturn right. okay. you know those are very very far away from being earth sized okay so this has been a bit of a bit of an exoplanet goal here is can we see something which is in the goldilocks zone and has water and is sort of roughly earth sized to within a few earths and this is incredibly important because yeah. these measurements are so hard it basically proves that we're improving but Every, every time we take more measurements, even with the Hubble, you know, Hubble's not a new telescope. No, no. <laughs> right. Dragging that one out of the garage again to have a look. That's that's not cutting edge. But we there's so but much we, can, we can still do. We can do it. Yeah. So what you're saying is that the newsworthiness of this is not, hey, we've found another Earth that we could potentially go to and find life on or live on once we ruin this one. It's not that. It's not that at all. It's look what we can find. We did it. We found this thing. We can do this. Let's yeah. look for more. So m- m- cast your mind back a few years to when we were only finding gas giant planets. We were only finding Jupiter-sized exoplanets. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, that's all we had the technology yeah. to do. And, and suddenly time. exoplanets were all about, oh, it's all Jupiter-sized planets. Wow, who saw that coming? I said, no, we just haven't been able to see the smaller ones yet. Yeah. And then every time we found a smaller and smaller and smaller one, this hit the news and everyone got very excited mm. because we started to get better and better and better at finding these little planets. And so this is kind of the same thing, except now we're better at finding atmospheres of smaller and smaller exoplanets. Yeah, and go figure that there's a little bit of a mismatch between what the astronomers find really exciting and the, the nuance of that story and what the world's press finds exciting, which for no fault of their own will be, so sorry, why do we care? Oh, it's kind of like Earth. Well, it's like us. I must have water and life on it. Fantastic. I will run with that um, and just quote Emily, the astronomer, on that. <laughs> like, it makes sense, right? Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, but the should, nuance yeah. is, is the hard part. Exactly, yeah. And, I mean, this uh, taking this another step further, I mean, these um, mini Earths, sort of super Earths, uh, mini Neptunes, are planets that we don't have a local variant of to study yeah as we said before so we know much much less about this type of planet than we do about gas giants or rocky earth like things and given that they seem to be the most common type that there is we should probably spend a bit of time looking at them exactly and i've i looked in just a little bit to sort of see you know what what is the current sort of state of knowledge on these things and it's really interesting Mm -hmm. because yeah huge question marks but the huge question marks are really kind of cool because we're trying to figure out how much, say, you might have a rocky core underneath a giant atmosphere. Yeah, well, you, you said just a minute ago when I said, so this is a rocky planet, right? And you oh, no, not necessarily. So these things can be sort of somewhere in between an earthy, Marsy, rocky type thing and a big gas ball. Somewhere in between, where it's got rocky yeah. bit in the middle and huge thick atmosphere on the outside. Yeah. So we can actually break up the two categories of super Earth and mini Neptunes. Oh, ah, okay. So they do have sort of their own. I mean, it's how you define each group is not official, but it, there's kind of some working tools. Oh, really? Astronomers use. haven't really nailed down the definition of something. <laughs> yeah, Go figure. No. Huh. Well, we haven't got an ex- Sorry, definition what was that, of an exoplanet uh, yet. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> we haven't got an exoplanet definition yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to start there. Start with what do you people do with your time, honestly? (sighs) Anyway, go on. Okay, so a super Earth loosely is something that's maybe between two to ten times the mass of Earth. Mm -hmm. Then, just for reference, how much bigger than Earth is, say, Neptune? 
So Neptune is uh, 17 times the mass okay. of Earth. Okay. So we're sort of going halfway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So this is where it gets complicated. So <laughs> <laughs> super Earths we tend to define yeah, from mass, mm-hmm. whereas mini Neptunes we tend to define from radius. Right. Which is two to four times the radius of Earth. Is that because gassy type planets will tend to be bigger because yes. ga- gases are more spread yeah. out? So if we just take Uranus That's and Neptune. There, kids. Yeah, <laughs> Uranus and Neptune put them by each other. They yep. actually, they one of them holds the record as being closest to Earth in radius, and one of them holds the record of being closest to Earth in mass. Right. And it's not you know. So Uranus is four um, Earth radii, but it's fourteen times the mass. So much more dense. So it's yeah, yeah. So it's more dense. Whereas Neptune is sorry, Neptune is three point eight. So it's slightly smaller, but seventeen times the mass. So it's more dense oh, okay. than Uranus. Right. Yeah. 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 So the compositions are completely different. Yeah. And it turns out that density is actually one of the key things we can measure about exoplanets. How do you do that? It's again mass and radius. So density right. is mass divided by. Radius sure. or volume, yep. um, and we can measure both of those things from a transit if we know good information about the star that it's going around. So it's fairly easy to say, yeah, we know the density of this exoplanet or average density. Sure, okay. How much of that is a very very dense core in a very very light atmosphere? I see what you mean. Yeah, versus just a kind of solidish thing all the way through is very very tricky. But we do know that low, very, very low densities, things in this kind of regime, they've got lots of hydrogen, helium. This is these primary atmospheres again. They're probably um, not very suitable to go and live on. Mm. We don't really breathe hydrogen and helium no, all that much. No, I mean, it might make your voice a bit funny and might make you suddenly explode into flame. Yeah. <laughs> well, only if there's oxygen around, I guess. But yeah. yeah, it's not, you know, it's not atmosphere as we know it. No. No. And if you go super, super high density, you've probably got something really rocky, but with not really an atmosphere Mm. at all, which, you know, like Mars, for example, not super friendly to go live on. No, Mars is not the kind of place you want to take your kids, as Elton John once said. (laughs) So what we're looking for is this kind of intermediate. Mm. Again, the middle ground, the Goldilocks middle ground. Um, And you can have water. You can have an ocean planet, for example. Or for an intermediate mass, you could have a really dense core in this big atmosphere. Or you could have a gas dwarf, which is kind of a thick, gassy thing. I guess coming back to why this is why this is interesting and, and interesting for different reasons than to different people. It's it's not interesting because we've discovered Earth two. It's interesting because we've discovered this at all. But it gives us the the hope and the ambition to then go, all right, let's look at more of these and let's see if we can start nailing down some of these possibilities, because there's a lot of, as you say, there's a lot of big question marks about these, these super Earths, um, you know, mini Neptunes. There's a lot of question marks. There's a lot, lot of models all competing and none of them are winning the race yet. Yeah. And it's probably true that all of these types of planets exist, right? So now when you come to me um, after you've made your first exoplanet discovery and say, Yay. well, I've got this super Earth, I'll be like, yeah, cool. But What's it made of? Yeah. Which one is it? Like, oh, can't I just have this? No, you need to go and do some more work. Okay. Exactly. All right. Can I borrow Hubble? Well, even better. And mm-hmm. f- soon you're going to be able to use the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope. Soon. Very soon. <laughs> Come on. Go on, James Please. Webb. Please. And what will that do for us? Well, James, unlike Hubble, James Webb is built for this mm-hmm. task, right? It's got spectrographs um, on board. It's got grisms as, as well that are designed. It's got grisms coming out the wazoo. <laughs> it's got designed to do these measurements because when now we know that all these exoplanets exist. And even better, now that we know what kind of stars are the easiest ones to go find them around, uh, we can basically build the instruments to be designed to do exactly the, the right job. This is why everyone, and every once in a while when we talk about James Webb Space Telescope and we just, come on, because it's been delayed so many times, but it's got so much cool stuff. It's going to be awesome exactly. when it gets up there and works. We're just everyone, the entire world of astronomy is rooting for these guys. Come on. It's going to be so perfect for these these cool stars, right? There's lots of infrared light. The planets go around quick. So, for example, the analysis of this um, exoplanet, they looked at eight different transits to make these measurements. Now, if you wanted to do that for something that was the Earth, You've got to wait eight years. That's eight years. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this is only, you know, what, eight months. 
Yeah, although it took a little bit longer yeah. to get all the Hubble time that let's, you wanted. Let's, but, let's call it But you can do it within a couple, couple of years, years. Yeah. definitely, yeah. So we, this is why exoplanet science, at least in the terms of the search for atmospheres and life, is really focusing on this part, these types of stars. The flip side of that, of course, is there's massive debate in the field as to whether the types of stars that we're looking at, these planets that are going around, they're actually n maybe not suitable for life at all. Oh, why is that? Well, it turns out that these really cool stars might be just too violent, too destructive for life to exist. Like what kind of violence? What are we talking about? If, if we were on one of these planets, <laughs> what would happen? Well, there's a huge part of the formation of these stars when they get born. They're just, they're just nasty pieces of work, <laughs> basically. <laughs> They've got enormous flares and eruptions of radiation that Ooh. are coming off them. The ultraviolet like flux of this light coming off is extreme. And we know that ultraviolet is really damaging That's to, not good. No. to life on Earth. So if you're just going to be blasted with radiation and then horrible flares and lots of flickering. so Especially as if you're even like a lot closer to the star in the first place. Yeah, and you're whipping really around close. it every 33 days to have another swing past that latest flare. <laughs> I think. And if the light's varying all this time, like it's sort of constantly huge variations in mm. the amount of light that you're receiving on your planet. So it's not decided that it's impossible for life to be in mm -hmm. these environments, but it's pretty hotly debated whether... Maybe we should be yeah. looking elsewhere as well. <laughs> yeah, but we're too impatient. This yeah. is the problem. Yeah. If you want, to, you want to go to the sun, you've got to, you've got to go for things that are years or more. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of the Syzygy Podcast. But it doesn't bring us to the end of the search for, for possible venues for life in space. Emily, we've got so many places we could look at. Just maybe not those really, really evil, cooler stars. That sounds awful. Maybe. It's, it's yeah, it's hard to say. Mm, okay. To say. Well, we'll have to come back and revisit this one in the future. In the meantime, if you want to keep in touch with us, there's plenty of ways you can do that. You can go to our website, syzygy.fm, check out all the past episodes, all the show notes, go on back and listen to everything way back to episode one and even zero, the teaser that we started with. Check out um, our shiny new logo too. Exactly. It's had a bit of a makeover. Uh, and you can send us some comments through there. You can go and find the contact page and just send us a few notes. But that's not the only way. Emily, how else can people find us. We are on the Tweetiverse. We are. So if you like your news short, punchy and very, very exciting, yes. of course, every episode of Syzygy delivers that, but also Twitter does as well. So if you join us at SyzygyPod, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y-P-O-D, then we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. All of the, all of the social media. Well, maybe not all, all of them. them. There are lots of social medias, but if you're in doubt, just see if you can find us at Syzygy Pod. Um, a couple of things we'd love you to do for us. We're always interested in rising up through the noise of the podcast universe. So if you want to help us out and share the fun and enjoyment and sheer wonder of astronomy with your friends and relations, then tell them about us. Spread the news. Go onto your podcast client of choice and give us a couple of stars and a review that always really helps because it does help us to rise up and if you want to help even further pop on over to patreon.com slash syzygypod where you can become a financial supporter of the show but whether you do that or whether you just spread the word verbally either way you're fabulous to us and we will catch you again for another bit of astronomical fabulousness next time on the syzygy podcast see you later emily see you later bye 